dad had a question of, so how do you come up with all these questions? Oh, you should hear all the conversations I have. Oh, that's exactly what I told dad. And I, I just thought <laughs> yeah. maybe you read, read a lot about this, but I guess from yeah, actual. Yeah, I, I feel like my brain is on accelerated curiosity mode all the time. And for every problem someone states, I'm thinking of 10 questions to dig deeper, figure mm-hmm. things out. Welcome to Power Your Life Today, the podcast that helps you live a life of more service, value, and love. I'm your host, Christy Joe, mind and body strategist and creator of Power Your Life Today. If you are ready to build and apply mindset strategies to help you stand in your power, head to PowerYourLifeToday.com to download the female's guide to powering her life. Welcome to season three, where I am interviewing my parents about parenting power. They're the two people I admire most in this world, and I'm delighted to share them and their insights with you. Today, we are discussing respect and how to be the example in power session number 58. In our conversation, we will discuss dealing with mean, snarky behavior of teenagers. An example of when my dad took his medical anatomy students to the cadaver lab, how he handled the respect that would be needed in that situation. How Respect is about setting expectations and communicating them, how to acknowledge when someone is in authority, how kids can be taught to handle disagreements among themselves, how our family's religious background impacted a great deal of how we handled those types of situations, how to teach proper apologies, the habits of those religious practice beliefs that contributed to our family's bonding, and how to look inside to assess how you are reacting and how to do better and not be so hard on yourself at the same time. My favorite quote from my mom is when she's talking about how when we knelt together to say our family prayers each day, how uh, (laughs) I'll just, you know, I'm not going to give it away. Just wait for that part. It's it's super cute. And and just imagine seven little kids in the situation she describes. Many good memories popping back. And my favorite quote from my dad, be polite, whether there is agreement or not. I am super excited for you guys to listen to this. This is probably one of my favorite episodes we've done so far. Just love my parents. So fun to chat with them and to get their perspectives and insights. And I'm sure you will learn a lot and can't wait to hear what you think. Be sure to email me if you have anything great to say and any information to pass on. And you can reach me at Christy Joe at body buddies.com. Just tap on your show notes. And that is in this show notes right there. You can click right on there. All right, let's get going. Welcome back to another Parenting Power podcast from Power Your Life today. Mom and dad, thank you so much for being Being here, we're recording this on Friday night. We're glad to be here. Best thing to do. I was looking forward to a date with my parents. Yeah. Oh, nice. (laughs) (laughs) Today we are talking about how to teach children to be respectful. What an interesting topic. If we step back and look at all the different events and challenges that we're facing in our world and all the different possible situations that parents could be encountering. This is a, an interesting topic. So I'm excited to explore some of these things with you. Recognizing that the difference between respect and disrespect can be completely different for every culture, ethnicity, family. Um, maybe there's going to be some common grounds on the human race scale we can look at. The difference between respectful conversation with another person is with kindness some charity and compassion where disrespectful is accusational you did this you you know blaming uh shaming um accusing other people of doing things instead of taking maybe responsibility i'm thinking of situations at work situations with children and blaming about tabling those type of things well, that we do so- see come out as adults <laughs> right and I would consider maybe calling it healthy lifestyle living, healthy being the operative word. There is so much dysfunction, dis-ease um, in relationships. And, you know, and that's all correlated with respect. But I think respect can be a very narrow word. But I think this subject is not narrow at all. And I think it it deals mostly with healthy relationships, even when there's conflict. You can have healthy conflict, or in these terms, respectful conflict. Dad, you probably see an amount of respect versus disrespect at the high school where you teach. Uh-huh. Is there any way that you can describe for us what 
some of those respectful situations with, with students might be in comparison with those situations that are not and, and how you observe that? I think a lot of it um, is based on politeness, whether there's agreement or not, being polite anyway, um, doing as asked, even if you don't agree with it. Hmm. Body language can tell a lot, too, and I can tell if a student is being respectful or not. Sometimes even if they're trying to do what's good but not feeling it inside, <laughs> I might be able to see that in body language. I think about your, just, was it last week that um, Dad had a, a field trip to the new medical school that's here in southern Utah, just a few miles away from here in St. George, and he got to take, what classes were you? did you get to take? Medical anatomy classes got to take them to the cadaver lab. And there were a total of about 60 students that could get to go. And one of the concerns we talked about um, was cell phones. And because there is such a high level of respect required in going to the cadaver lab. And dad's class school was the first one to get invited to do this tour with the cadavers. Wow. And so, you know, Dad's really concerned. Well, I, I prepped them a lot beforehand about the expectations and what, and the photography or use of technology during that, the tour, was strictly prohibited. But I still worried. What if they're just so used to whipping them out when they buzz or something? So anyway, I, I decided with with mom's help a little bit, <laughs> to just collect their cell phones. And I simply made it a matter of fact. I simply stated it. This is what's going to happen, you know, two or three days ahead of time. When you get on the bus, we'll take your cell phone. When we get back on the bus, you'll get your cell phone back. Nobody said anything in a complaint, complaint at Nobody all. Nobody complained. Wow. They just, they just did it. So I think a lot of it was, was prepping ahead, though. Well, and hmm. being clear on what expectations are. I think sometimes maybe as parents we're not clear, maybe because we haven't thought something through. We can be very nebulous and, yeah, well, whatever. And so then when Johnny messes up and we take him to task because they're being disrespectful, well, did we make it clear what we expected of them? You know, and so I think Dad's class was a great example. These kids, every single one of them, was totally respectful of Dad as the teacher of what he was requiring of them. And they had the most incredible experience, and then the medical school was so impressed. And so they're inviting other schools to have the same opportunity. Hmm. Wow. So, you know, there's a plug for... The importance of teaching our children to behave in a respectful manner, whether they like it all the time or not, to acknowledge when someone is in authority, um, you follow their instructions. Not everybody does that. And so it's an, I think it's a very important thing. Yeah. What about when kids are really small and parents are pulling their hair out, watching their children hit, bite, punch, tackle, tease? <laughs> Can you think of any situations or stories <laughs> of whether when we were young or some of the grandkids that might help us think about some better ideas of handling these types of situations? What do you remember? Well, you know. <laughs> oh, well, we had to sit down with our sibling and we had to – work it out. We had to communicate and we were not allowed to do anything until we had apologized to each other. And oftentimes we had to clean together. And that was one of the ways that we had to learn to get along and to talk and communicate and treat each other with respect that grew over time. <laughs> we were yeah. good. All, all those girls were good at scratching. We were great scratchers. Mm. Clawers might be a better description. Yeah. Yeah, there were big chunks of skin pulled out sometimes. <laughs> well, I have to tell you, it makes me feel good to hear your 
remembrance because just last Saturday we had Desmond and Cayman here. We, there was a Chinese New Year celebration, and they're going to have all kinds of games, so we brought the boys over here. Well, while we were waiting to, you know, for it to be time to go over, I was outside. I heard Cayman come unglued, which means he's unhappy about something. And so I came in the house to find out that there had been an altercation between Desmond and Cayman, so five almost six and almost four. We'll just say a six-year-old and a Mm four-year-old. And I was not present. I did not see what exactly happened, like happened so many times with you kids growing up. And I learned very quickly, there will always be two sides to the story, and I might get it wrong. One of the kids might represent it better than the other one. It may not be accurate. And so I just went back into parenting mode that I've practiced for how many years, and I said, Desmond, came in, come here. Was there a problem? Yes. Here's the deal. I would like you to go sit on the couch and you guys figure out how to deal with your problem. You may not get off the couch well. So they went got on the couch and sat on two different ends. I kind of watched and waited a minute. And then I came back in. Nope, you may not sit on the arm of the chair. Nope, you may not sit apart from each other. You must sit together and figure it out. And then I'd leave the room. And and they're not really doing anything. And then I went back in and I said, now, do you know how Jesus helps solve problems? Would Jesus be rude? No. Would he forgive? Yes. Would he say, I'm sorry? Yes. So I will tell you that those are things that can help you figure out how to solve the problem with each other. I will not tell you how to do it. I will give you recommendations, but good luck. Well, and so they're still sitting there kind of mad at each other. And so then I came in and I said, you have five minutes to solve your problem. If you can't do it, that's fine. I will put you in the car and I will take you home. We will not go to the festival. And I set the timer. Well, within three minutes, they had solved their problem. They're hugging each other, saying, sorry, I forgive you. (laughs) And it was great. And, you know, it's something I was talking to Amelia about, you know, teaching our children to be mediators. When they have a problem, they have to figure out how to solve their problem. When you kind of fast forward 20 years and they become an employee, wouldn't an employer love having a problem solver rather than a problem creator as an employee? And it starts when they're four and six years old on the couch, learning Mm -hmm. how to get along, how to identify their problem instead of mom or dad running in, Johnny, you go on the timeout chair. Susie, you go clean the bathroom. But that's what sometimes what I did with the kids. I said, hey, if you can't figure out how to get along together, you have no business playing with friends. And to help you learn how to get along, do you remember this, Christy? You and Amelia oh, go clean I the bathroom. Like deja vu. Yeah. <laughs> I like deja vu is ringing in my ears right now. <laughs> well, and it was so effective because, number one, I really wanted to bring across the point that, that our family was the most important thing. And until you learn to get along with each other, you do not get to do friends. And the best way to learn to get along together is work together. And the best place to work, from my viewpoint was the bathroom because everybody (laughs) hated to clean the bathroom. When you have to scrub a toilet together, you want to get it done. And it just, and then I got out of, I got a clean bathroom out of it. And two kids who learned that I meant what I said, you have to figure out, I'm not telling you how to do it, but you have to get along. And until you figure that out, there won't be very many perks in your life. Yeah. I'm recalling a little bit of an, a shift that would always happen in those situations. Cause at first you're glaring and you're so angry at the other sibling because how dare they make it so that you have to be cleaning the bathroom right now and baseboards. Oh, baseboards with the toothbrush. That was the worst. <laughs> that just was gross. Like seeing the murky water, <laughs> yep. but that was my least favorite chore. I'll take the bathroom any day. But there was a shift that would happen when we were with the other sibling where at first it was like humor. There would be something that would make us laugh 
And then it was almost like banding together in unity because how dare mom put us in this situation. (laughs) So now we're a team. But I think that is, those are the situations that have bonded us and truly loyalty between every single sibling. There is not one, all of us kids, that there's right. a bad relationship. Nor, I'm not even, I wouldn't even say a eh, relationship. They are great. They are strong. I think so too. Well, and I think parents can be wrong because they don't, they really don't know all the details. And I think it's so important for the kids to be involved in the problem solving because if the parents do it there's it will cause more problems i think they have got to figure out how to teach their kids to do this and you know you have to be careful because if you've got a much older child bullying or taking advantage of a younger child you have to be careful there i think but when it's just a problem, you got the red car, I wanted the red car, and so he hits them, to, you know, it, those kinds of things, this works really well with. And if parents start when the kids are young, by the time they're teenagers, this isn't too much of a problem. Yeah. <laughs> they know what's going to come down the pipe. <laughs> right. Powerful women are needed more than ever in today's society, not as a threat to men, but as a compliment. When we as women stand in our power to achieve our happiest, healthiest selves, everyone around us benefits as well. Head over to PowerYourLifeToday.com to download my free tool, A Female's Guide to Powering Her Life. In this download, you will learn the five power tools that will help you minimize stress, increase focus, and help you go to bed at night feeling like you are totally on your A-game. Again, that's Power Your Life today.com what about as kids are getting older and and we're dealing with catty gossipy you know type of bullying ages 15 to 18 or even in college um i i wish i could think of a story i just i being in the dance world you know there's plenty of that um yeah, i was gonna say <laughs> but, i but don't how did that happen with our kids, I don't re- remember that no, being a problem. No, and I think that's because we have always been taught respect, that that was never something. Gossiping about other people, being intentionally malicious uh, was never something. But that is something I know goes on quite a bit in the world. So maybe we can just talk more about the topic rather than the story. What I observe as a dance teacher is that parents can feed their children's lack of respect by the way they conduct themselves and it learned yes. behavior. Yeah. Very definite. Yeah. When okay, I do have a story that I thought of. <laughs> it goes way back to 1982 on the Indian Reservation. Actually, it must have been 83 because Denzel was oh, three going on four. We had a neighbor who um didn't like Denzel very much <laughs> as this little boy because <laughs> he threw rocks and he was a good shot. And when I was at the kitchen window one day, I saw Denzel chuck some rocks at the, so Denzel was three, this girl was six, you know, a little bit older, but the mom came running out and just screamed at Denzel and said, don't you ever do that again? If you do that again, then she picked up some rocks and chucked them point blank range at Denzel. And, you know, I'm watching the whole thing. And then Denzel put his hands on his hips and said, so that didn't hurt. And I wanted to go out and cheer. (laughs) Yeah, Denzel. But I also knew I needed to be a responsible parent. So I waited for Denzel to come in the house. And I said, Denzel, you know, I saw what our neighbor did. And that wasn't right. And I want you to know that it wasn't right. But... I do expect you to always be polite. If somebody else is doing something wrong, then you come in the house, you come talk to me, but you be polite. And what she did was not polite. And so I think, and it took everything in me to do that because I wanted to clap him on the back and say, yeah, way to go. Way to stand up to a bully of a mom, you know. (laughs) But it was more important that he learn the right way to handle things. And I think parents, if they love their children, they need to do the right thing, not the easy thing. 
And the right mm-hmm. thing is to teach their children good life skills. If someone does something mean to you, do you haul off and hit them? Well, sometimes I feel like it. <laughs> but ultimately, really, um, and, you know, I thought, as I read down your list, that's so much about mm-hmm. how our family's religious background has impacted everything along these lines. You know, just like this little situation with Desmond and Cayman. You know, the first thing I reminded them about was, what would Jesus do? And, you know, we, there's just so much along those lines. If people have a religious background, that can be a huge foundation for what you want to accomplish in your family. And if you don't have that background, it might be a little shaky. So. I agree, 100%. Well, well, Dad, as commenting on that, what part do you think, what habits of practicing religion do you think contributed most to that that we did as a family? Reading scriptures together, having family prayer together, having family home evening, family council, just being, <laughs> being together, talking together about things like that. Nope, it's not another diet. The Power Foods Lifestyle's real-life approach helps you become a strategist of your own health using science, psychological tactics, and practical application techniques. You will not need to kiss your favorite foods goodbye, but you will start learning how food works in your body. You'll begin to tweak the way you construct meals. You'll learn how to balance your blood sugar. And most importantly, you will learn how to accept yourself for not being perfect and commit to the journey. It's messy, but you gotta keep going. Start your Body Buddies journey today with the Power Foods Lifestyle Starter Kit. So what's inside the Starter Kit? The paperback copy of the Power Foods Lifestyle, personally signed by me. The audiobook digital files so you can listen while you clean up, drive, cook, or do tasks around the house. My three PDF printable recipe books with over 150 delicious, simple, and totally easy recipes that even the most novice cook can enjoy. Six sample Power Foods Lifestyle fat loss meal plans for women. The Power Foods shopping list and the food prep planner. Now, if you were just to buy the copy of the paperback book on Amazon, that would run you about $22. The starter kit is only $37, which is going to save you over 60% of what you would pay if you were to buy all of these products separately. So I've put them all together, everything you need to really get this self-study journey started. This is the best way to get started and learning whether you're ready to start with coaching now or ready to do the academy. This is the best place to get started. You do have what it takes to pass Power your mind and body. Let Body Buddies and the Power Foods Lifestyle be your next path of progression into a sustainable lifestyle change. I just would love for Dad to explain. Can you just summarize each of those activities, like what it looked like and when we did it, synopsis? Okay. Reading scriptures, since you girls went to dance early before school, we had to read scriptures at Earlier than you left, so sometimes it was yeah. at five, 5 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> and everybody got up, and if it was cold, we had the little heaters on, and and everybody had a turn to read, and then we knelt and held hands and prayed together. And that's I, this I have to insert because I'm so good at okay. waiting, you know. <laughs> but that was the <laughs> thought that I had was during scriptures when we or if we were having family prayer, leaving on a trip or you know, whatever it was, and if there was a rift between one of the kids or two and watching them, I don't want to hold their hand, (laughs) but, you know, and I think we explained this to you kids uh, once, how we started holding hands as a family for family prayer, and it was that when Dad and I were first married, we would kneel together, we'd hold each other's hands and pray. And then Denzel came along, and when he was old enough to kneel or stand, he would, we would, the three of us, and then add Jamie, and then Brandon, then you, and then Amelia, then Natalie, then Dallin. <laughs> we just gradually added everyone in, and so it's just become a family tradition, and I think a sweet one, where we hold each other's hands as we pray to our Heavenly Father. And when you're not the happiest with one of your siblings, and you have to hold their hand. I remember Pinky holds, 
you. I don't want to hold your whole hand. I'll hold your finger. (laughs) But it's amazing when you pray together and hold hands that even that helps solve a lot of the problems. Yeah, I love that. Well, and even watching some of the, the siblings with kids and watching their family and watch that tradition continue is really cool. Yeah. Um, let's go back to, so dad, you were explaining scriptures and prayer. And so then you talked about family home evening and family council, which people may never have heard of those two things. Okay. Family home evening was what was once a week on Monday nights. And we had a little wheel <laughs> that we would turn each week so that everybody had a different assignment. It, opening song, opening prayer, uh, give the lesson, tell a story, play um, a game, play a game have refreshments. <laughs> <laughs> and so everybody had a turn at everything, and it was just expected that everyone would follow through. And I think it helped us build a lot of unity together, a lot of dependence on each other for that follow through. And family council was similar. It was We usually held it on Sundays, which was a time to get together and discuss the upcoming week to calendar everybody's schedule so we could make it all work during the week. And we would talk if there were problems, if there were things that we needed to discuss. This was the time that we really talked about what's going on, family dynamics, and it's when I... Because dad was gone for a lot of the time when we'd do family council and I would make a mom's moment. And I called it a mom's moment to remind me, don't take too long because the kids will get bored. (laughs) (laughs) But it was always something, an idea, a thought that I wanted to share with the kids. So there was, it wasn't just planning, you know, and organizing. And I remember sending a lot of those mom's moments to Denzel when he was in Iraq and Brandon when he was in the Philippines and you know just those mom's moments have gone around and well now somewhere. we have binders of those you gave those to us for Christmas and now we all have right. a completely beautiful binder with all of those teachings um, of mom's um, moments I was just going to say and some of those in short form are showing up on the windows now on the window <laughs> that mom paints. <Yeah. laughs> I, I did want to say, going back to the family council thing, I found it so interesting the past few weeks as I'm really assessing the needs of families and individuals and, and couples with their nutrition, their healthy lifestyles. We're fighting hardcore statistics of people going down to disease, illness, and death. I, and I, I see that getting more and more grim over the next decade to the point that it, it, this is no longer, uh, oh, that'd be nice. It's, it's a necessity. So anyhow, as I've been really trying to train and help families get clear on these processes and what it looks like, do you know that family council has come up and I created this weekly meal planner that was very much like what you did with us, Mom, where it was we all to contribute and what what kinds of meals would we like to see this week and it was planned and it was there and it was planned ahead of time for the most part. Yeah. But it was that proactive and that only could happen because our family had a planned time that we gathered and we communicated and we had that unity instead of putting it all on you or Mm -hmm. then, then what would happen if dad, he's at work all day, he comes home. Oh, nothing's made. There's no plan. What's he going to eat? Where, where do all these things start to snowball and create tension and problems and, and stress in the home rather than systems. And that's what I'm grateful for is that these systems were implemented into our home that I think respect was taught all throughout that. They're, they're all intertwined. I think you're right. And, you know, we just, Dad and I, from the very beginning, we've just always sat down and had a meal together. Um, I remember when we were engaged, Dad would come home to my roommates and I, and we had dinner, and he would sit and hold my hand. He would eat left-handed so he could hold my hand with his right hand. And, um, you know, and some things haven't changed in a long time. And, <laughs> and I am grateful that it's been something very important in my heart that I will always cook for my husband I will always sometimes he cooks for me and that's great but 
and you know probably one of the sweetest things that I've heard from you kids is I knew you'd have something made you know when the kids come from out of town or just across town I told RJ you'd have something made you know mm-hmm. it's just something you kids have always been able to depend on and it may seem like a little thing but I think it's a huge thing for children, spouses to know that there's a, a center, a hub in the family at somewhere between five and six o'clock, dinner is going to be ready. Yeah. And I think it's a great thing. And if you don't happen to be home for dinner, I will bring your dinner to you. Oh, it's so comforting. And it breaks my heart when so many of my young dancers, it comes dinner time and I'm saying, what What are you eating? What's for dinner? Oh, I don't have anything, nor money to go get something. And as I'm digging deeper and, and trying to find where's the disconnect here, where's this lack of care for these kids that they don't have their own devices yet to pr- you know, make their own money and to go and right. buy and prepare their own foods. And it just really caused me to reflect and be very grateful. Um, I want to go into apologizing. Um, I find it interesting in our technological world how even us adults still have to work on this. And I say that probably because I had a little situation this week that made me really look at how easily adults cannot handle things well. (laughs) And somebody Mm -hmm. didn't handle things well with me. And it's so easy to fire off a text and accuse and be rude and blame and all these things. And I'm sitting there thinking, wow, where was this behavior learned? (laughs) And so it, it made me think, okay, when, when is it appropriate to apologize? Unfortunately, I didn't get an apology, but I could see beyond it. Um, when, because it, how can we allow others to have their opinions and ideas? Is there anything that we can do proactively in apologizing? Should we always be the one to apologize? Is there a formula? What if someone had never really had the experience of proper apology training? How would you go helping them with that? Well, when Dallin was two, um, Julie, Julie Schramm and I went to a BYU Education Week, and the very last class that we attended um, was kind of by accident. We'd been there all week. We were tired. We were ready to go home. We were leaving our last class, and there were hordes of people going into the ballroom at, at BYU, and we're quick flipping through our program going, what class is this? What class? And then I found it. It said, how to give an apology and ask for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. We turned right around and went into the class. I couldn't tell you any (laughs) other classes we attended at that education week, but I still, 22 years later, remember that class. And it's had a huge impact. Um, I think, and this, okay, so going back to Desmond and Cayman on the couch. Well, at first Desmond's going, sorry, Cayman. I'm going, that is not how you apologize. Sorry. (laughs) And so, again, parents have a responsibility to teach their children how to apologize, and sometimes that's done by example. Um, But one of the things I think there is always something you can apologize for, and this is something I have always appreciated in Dad because he is really good at sincerely apologizing when he even though he is not the one at fault I'm the one that's melting down and he will say I am so sorry I was such a clod I am so sorry I don't know what I was thinking I will work at being better how do you stay mad at that or upset or hurt or disappointed or whatever feeling when someone gives a true sincere apology it soothes all kinds of things and so there was a situation fairly recently with a neighbor there there had been a miscommunication and I truly had not done anything, but I knew this neighbor was very upset. And I just had the strongest feeling that I needed to go over and sincerely apologize. 
And that can be hard when you know you didn't do anything wrong. But it didn't change the fact that I knew it was important to do. And so I went over to the neighbor, and luckily one of the kids let me in the house, and I could tell that the mom was not happy that I was in her home. And But I just mm-hmm. kept a very light attitude and just talked in general for a couple of minutes. And then I said, I need to apologize. I am so sorry. I did not understand that this was what was meant. I can see it now, but I did not see it yesterday. And I am so, so sorry because I can see how it has caused some problems. And it was amazing how the tone and the feeling of this woman's demeanor changed because I was willing to give a sincere, meaningful apology. Um, and I learned it from Dad. <laughs> and this class. I think, yeah, I think you both are great at that. And that's another comment I wanted to make is through that observation. As an adult, I cannot tell you how many times I think, no, my parents would handle it like this. Mm-hmm. And those learned uh, lessons at a very young age, I, I, you would be surprised how many times did I hear you even on the phone with uh, like a phone company, you know, because there was a miscommunication about the bill or you didn't think it was right or, you know, any customer service situation and how you handled it, how kindness was always at the front end. Now, matter of fact, I, I will always say was there, and I have learned how to be matter of fact as well because of that, which I'm grateful for. Yeah. About kindness and respectful, not this belligerent, attacking, accusational way that unfortunately I do observe in everyday life, and hopefully I catch it before I ever do that as well. I'm certainly not perfect, but. Yeah. Well, and oh, I think, thanks for being the example. That's just what I wanted to say. Well, you're welcome. Welcome. We'll keep working on it. How's that? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I think a lot of times as we, hopefully, people look inside themselves. I don't think everybody does, but I think it's a really important skill to develop. Why did I do what I did? Um, I have made lots of mistakes as a parent. And there, I have cried myself to sleep many times because I didn't do things well. But I was willing to look at what I did and work at improving. And, you know, the next day, maybe I still got upset, you know, but over time, there's improvement if you're willing to keep working at it and um Desmond I had Desmond put a little rubber band on his wrist uh mm-hmm. because he was doing a literal uh a guttural sound with his throat just after his cold he'd kind of gotten in this habit oh, yeah. I said okay just kind of snap the rubber band well he didn't like that too much after two times he's grandma do I have to do this I said oh no you don't have to do it but if you make that sound maybe you could just kind of tap your wrist to remind you that you want to stop that because it doesn't sound really great. And and so, you know, just finding little strategies that we can use, which the spoon we talked about before, the spoon was a strategy yeah. I needed to make sure I did not beat my children because I did not want to do that. And so it was a very stopgap thing that I implemented and it worked very well. But... Other people seeing it may not have understood, you know, why that was in place, but it worked for me. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's really important for parents to analyze, why did I get upset at Johnny? Was I embarrassed? Was I worried that he would keep doing this? Did it make me look bad? You know, just really looking at why. Why did I react this way? Because if you don't look at it, you'll keep doing it. Yeah. And that's not a good thing if we want to grow and improve 
And if we don't improve, our kids aren't going to improve. That's right. Well, and I think that that's the takeaway. I think that's really beautiful is that really they're learning from the parents. They're learning from the adults in their lives. And as we all try to be better people, we work on our communication, our self-analysis, our apologies, our respect to others and to children, then perhaps there it is. There's the teaching. Well, when I read your list of things you wanted to talk about, my first thought was, how do you teach respect? You don't. It's learned. Kids learn it by watching. And so hopefully you, as parents, as adults, as older teenagers, learn how to be respectful because there are people watching you and they will mimic and emulate what they see in you. And hopefully you're a good thing to mimic. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave us a review. You can do that on iTunes, Stitcher, or any of the podcast players you are listening to this on. We are grateful for each and every one of your listens and hope you find that value. Through your reviews, we're able to reach more people. That's just the way the internet works. So we do thank you in advance for your positive review and for sharing your story with us. If at any time you'd like to reach out, share with us some insights, what you're learning from the Power Your Life Today podcast, definitely welcome that. You can reach me at Christy Joe, K R I S T Y J O, at body buddies.com. And if you're interested in learning more about nutrition and fitness and becoming a strategist and a critical thinker of your own health, join me on my other podcast, Body Buddies, where you will learn how to power your body one meal, one workout, and one day at a time. 